Thank you very much for coming in. It's after lunch. It's a hard session to everybody's like a little bit sleepy. I'll do my best to not interfere with your nap. <laughs> so my name is Yossi Taguri. I'm, um, uh, I'm the head of Missing Link AI, which was a company that joined uh, Samsung next year ago. Uh, and I'm going to tell you a bit about it later on. Uh, but I have to open with a confession, right? My whole life, I've lived in a lie, right? And it all started when I met my wife. My wife has a PhD in uh, uh, materials engineering. She's pretty, pretty smart. And I wanted to impress her when I just met her. And she did the chemistry for her first degree. And so I asked, you know what? I know that the atom has this nucleus in the middle, and there's the electrons that roll around it. She said, yes. I said, so what's in the middle between the electron and the nucleus? She said, I don't understand what you're asking. I said, what's in the middle? It's like 3D, right? There's space inside. There must be something. And I said, no, 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 no. You, you, you do not understand. And she gave me a book from the 60s about chemistry. And in that book, uh, an atom looks like that. It's just the probability of an electron to be in a specific place at a specific time, right? So how do you teach kids about electrons when they, something looks like this, right? Somebody had to think about this beautiful model, simple way to explain things, right? But there was a good ending to that story of me trying to impress my wife, right? We have four daughters, right? So something has worked out. But in the following session, I'm going, I'm going to actually lie a bit for the next 25 minutes, just to make it super simple, right? I am not a data scientist. I am an engineer. I've been coding since I was 11. Uh, and I taught myself because I didn't have any, anything else better to do. So, and I started getting into AI and deep learning just three years ago, maybe, right? And it all started because I've read one amazing post but by a guy called Andre Karpati. If I had a boy, I would definitely call him Andre Karpati. Now, Andre Karpati is the head of AI at Tesla now. Uh, but he used to be at OpenAI, and he used to give a course called CS231N at Stanford. And he has a remarkable ability of taking really uh, hard concepts and explaining them to everybody. So I promise you, you will not see even one equation. We're not going to, be, to talk about statistics or math or anything, right? Uh, so this post actually showed how with 60 lines of code, he's able to generate a machine that spits out all sorts of things that he didn't know about. One of the things was Shakespeare, right? Shakespeare poems. By feeding it a lot of Shakespeare uh, text, it learned the style uh, uh, of Shakespeare and was able to generate uh, uh, something similar. And he tried to do it with the same 60 lines of code, right? Without baking any rules into the code, he also did it on Latech. Latech is a, is is in a, an academic format for papers, right? So there's equations inside, and the machine just sped up. It doesn't make any sense, right? It doesn't really make any sense. But it learned the format of things. And then it tried to do it on code. It fed its source code, and then it learned the, the, um, uh, the math behind the structure of a, a software program. Now, that code doesn't run, but it could easily fool any engineer looking at it. It makes sense. It's, uh, uh, it, it has comments, the if has curly braces, if it has more than one line, it, it, it makes sense, right? Which blew my mind. Like, I've been coding since the age of 11, I have never seen 60 lines of code that is able to imitate something else so good, right? So just to make sense of all of this, you probably heard about AI, and uh, most people think about the Terminator when they hear about AI, and AI is definitely going to kill us all, but not anytime soon. So just to make some, some um, uh, order to things, artificial intelligence started in the 50s, right? There was so much promise with science fiction books, and we thought that AI, we're going to have robots helping us and replacing people, and, uh, uh, and it didn't happen. We actually went into what we call the AI winter, where nothing had happened. And in the 80s, uh, uh, the academia came up with machine learning, which is basically some statistical algorithms that uh, you need to work very hard in order to feed them with data so you can get something back. And then, less than 10 years ago, we started doing deep learning. And I'll show you the difference in a moment. 
But deep learning is just a sub-practice of machine learning. And we're probably going to have something even better than deep learning in the next coming uh, weeks. But with every technology, the barrier to entry goes down, right? So I can tell you, I cannot handle machine learning. It's too hard for me. But deep learning is, is, is easy. You can, like, in less than mon in a month, start up and running. So I'm going to explain to you like what the mechanics look like. So let's build a machine. Let's build an AI machine, right? It's going to have an input and it's going to be an output. And our machine, like all the AI machines, is it's going to recognize cats, right? That's what we have AI for, right? So how are we going to do it? It's basically, this is how it was done up to a few years ago with machine learning. You, they take, you take a cat and then you say, how do I know what is a cat? How do I describe in code? what is a cat, right? So I try to find shortcuts to what is a cat. I can say, you know, he has a round face and pointy uh, ears and chubby belly and everything. And we know how to look at an image and identify circles and rectangles and all sorts of simple things. And we can say, you know what, if they come together somehow, this is most likely uh, uh, a cat. And it's very easy, right? You take a cat, you see. You see the patterns and you make a decision, right? What happens with this, right? <laughs> Doesn't work out, right? How do I bridge the gap? And then we go and say, you know what? We'll take an engineer. He will get in, and he will work on those edge cases. So they write some more code to try to understand, well, you know, a cat is a very sophisticated, lazy, uh, 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 I love cats. By the way, I'm not a dog person. I'm a cat person. I really, uh, uh, this is really good. And uh, what do you do with this, right? As a human being, it's enough for you to see one cat and you know all of them. It's enough to see some of the cats. So how do you do this? This is very hard for computers, right? And how do I do this, right? So until a few years ago, that's how we did things. We extracted features, all those uh, features that we think are part of a cat, and we fed it into statistical models that tells us, you know what, on 60% eh, this is a cat, right? And obviously, going from pixels, from the image, to those small number of features, you lose a lot of information in that process, right? So your ceiling is very low in terms of how good you can become. But that's how we did stuff. It's very hard. By the way, those people that are, we did the feature extraction usually were PhDs, people that spent a lot of time being very intimate with pixels or audio or text. This is a lifetime spending on a domain, right? So in 2012, there was actually a, a huge breakthrough. Th there were three uh, important things that happened that changed everything for, for our industry. One was uh, uh, an experiment that YouTube did where they did, uh, we won't talk about unsupervised learning, but in 2012 they, they did an experiment. They took 85 million frames from different videos on YouTube and they wanted to see if they can get something back. Is there something uh, uh, if we join everything together? And two things came back. One, cats, cats uh, faces, there's lots of cats on YouTube. And the other is, is a human face, which you see a lot. The second breakthrough was with speech recognition at Microsoft, right? You know now the speech recognition, you have, probably have Alexas and Google Home. It's, it's a done deal. It's, it's already um, uh, done. And, but another thing happened right after Fei-Fei Ling from, uh, uh, from Stanford and then Google. Um, uh, she said, if we want to get better at computer vision, we need to make sure that everybody is working against the same data set, huge data set. So she built a huge data set of 15 million uh, uh, images. It's 256 by 256. It's not very big. And it's categorized with 22,000 categories. And the, 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 the competition would be if we hand out that data set and everybody can learn from it, we're going to also create another data set, which is the test data set. This is something that only we know what are the categories. And we're going to ask the community to build a model, to build a machine that learns from these 15 million uh, images and infer on the new data set that nobody knows what it means. So every year, they would ship out that new test data set and ask the, the community to come along. And they did it. They did it using machine learning. And the error rate is, was, you know, settled on 25. At first, you get really fast progress, and then everything stalls because the algorithms and technology uh, do not progress fast enough. And then, in 2012, there was the first team that came in with deep neural networks, with deep learning. And they made a huge improvement. What happened next is 
everybody went into deep learning. And that was a huge boost. Now, you need to understand that the human, as human beings, our error rate is 5%, right? Which is amazing. Now, in 2016, we were less than 3%. 2017, 2.25%. This is something that we are doing as a natural thing. And here is a machine that does that way, way, way better with us. Right? They stopped after that. It's, it's a done deal. We know how to implement a machine that does with computer vision. That's computer vision very, very good. So before we know how does that work internally, let's see how human beings are, 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 uh, are learning. This is from uh, um, a chef's table on Netflix, uh, the first um, season chef. Three stars Michelin teaches another sous chef um, about frying chips. Right? So there's no way in the world that we can learn in any other way. That's how we learn, by experimenting. And we need to actually feel that. There's no book I can give you to teach you how to be an astronaut. You actually have to go and do the training. And we have to train machines like we're training human beings. It's the same thing. We show them a lot of things that uh, are good, a lot of things that are wrong, and the machine needs to start to understand what is the difference. We don't know how to explain in words, or even if I could write the spec of how what's a faulty chip is, it would be extremely hard to implement it with somebody who just read the text, right? So a deep neural network is simply a set of neurons that are connected to one another. Now, a neuron is loosely coupled on the human neuron. It's a big lie that it works the same. It's not. But you could consider every, every node here, every neuron, as a matrix of numbers. It's just numbers. And the connection between them is just math that is going on. If you learned, if you did algebra, linear algebra 1 at university or school, and you know how to multiply two matrices, that's all the math that you need to know. And honestly, that's easy to learn from YouTube. That's very easy. So um, you need to understand that when the network or the machine sees an image, what it actually sees is the red, green, and blue values, right? Every image is red, green, and blue. You could consider it as a 3D matrix of numbers from 0 to 255. That's easy. If you get close to a, to a TV, you could see the LEDs. You could see that it's red, green, and blue sometimes, right? Uh, in, the old, in the old TVs, at least. So what we're feeding is just images. And unlike machine learning, we're not trying to make sense of what's inside. We're just feeding it raw images. We're not writing any code, right? It's just raw images. And what happens then is, is the following. We're taking all those nodes. We're initializing all the nodes, all the neurons with, with random numbers, just random numbers. We don't care what the, what the value is. So the network doesn't know anything. And then we want to start teaching it. So how do we do that? We basically take an image and we feed it inside. Now what happens is neurons starts to fire up, right? The network is just random, right, initialized, and it gives us a result. And it gives us a result. We feed in a cat and it tells, you know what, this is 20% cat and 80% dog, right? Because it doesn't know anything. So if you take that, we want to actually convert it from 20% cat and 80% dog to 100% cat, right? This is also called the loss function or the error function. And we know how to do this this day, right? We don't know how to do it in code, but we have an algorithm that actually knows how to fix the network. So what happens now, and this if you want to impress your data scientists at work, this is what you should quote, say, I know how backpropagation works. It's very, very cool. That will make you look like you know something, which is very easy. But what happens is we know how to calculate each neuron's uh, job or weight in that wrong decision. And we can fix those neurons to be a little bit closer to the real answer that we're looking for. So we're going back to each neuron. We understand exactly how to calculate it by the chain rule. And it's called backpropagation. And we fix that. 
Now, if I ask again about the same image, it won't be 20%. It might be 21% or a bit less than that. But it's going towards that right result. And we're doing it again and again and again and again and again. That's training, right? Um, and at the end, you feed a new image, neurons fire up, and we get a result. And it's not going to be 100% ever. It's going to tell you it's confidence level. It's 70% uh, a dog, right? So I just wanted to say, that, and this is where the technical part ends, there's a lot of ways to wire neurons. It's not really important how it's done. Just know that there's infinite ways to, to, to wire things up. So I want to show you a demo of actually training uh, a real machine uh, in real time. So let me just do this and do this. So this is uh, a playground that Google created, and I'm going to use the, the, the camera to train a machine. So this is going to be just the, uh, uh, the let's do speech, right? right? It, it is just uh, the, the first uh, example, and the second example, when I'm pressing this, I'm actually training it, right? Right, it takes samples, right? Now, awesome. right? Cool, right? And I'm going to train the third one, right? It's going to do like this. Yes. 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 Awesome. Awesome. And I'm going to do now. It's not really getting the all the cases, right? That's a good example of we need more data. We need more samples. So I'm going to train it a bit more and add a bit more samples and get them right. And then now it's better, right? Super easy to do that. Right? And it's all happened, like all the training, the backpropagation, everything happens in real time in the, in, the, in the browser. And it's around, by the way, something like 20 lines of code. It's not more than that. So it, it became very, very easy to build those uh, things. Right? So the next thing I want to show you is how, how does the neurons themselves look like? And uh, what you're seeing is, uh, is something that uh, uh, Yosinski is a guy that works at Uber today, created. We visualize the network itself. It's just numbers, so we can create pixels out of them. And one of the nicest things about it is that some of the pixels uh, are firing up only in specific cases. In this case, when they see uh, um, um, a face. And now we do not know why this happens. And we're able to identify this only by observing the network itself, which is kind of interesting. Like we could have written like an algorithm to detect faces and here is one neuron that uh, uh, naturally started identifying uh, important high level concepts like, like a screen. So this is also very, very interesting. So what have we achieved so far? So this is something from a few years ago where DeepMind uh, started doing this. The, the challenge was to feed the network just the pixels of an Atari game and give it a goal. The goal was to have a maximum number of points. And you could do only two things, right? Right or left. And they fed it uh, uh, into a deep neural network uh, in order to uh, learn how to play, right? And the goal is maximum uh, numbers. And again, the input is just the pixels. There's no rules, there's no code, no anything. And what happened is after a few hours of training, it started playing breakout better than any human being, right? Which is interesting. And then the, the, uh, they tried to apply it to other games and they did it quite successfully to Space Invaders. And then they applied the exact same thing to all the 8-bit games and it was very, very interesting. This, those are very simple games. But as you probably know, they also did it on, uh, on Go. And Go is a much harder game than chess. You probably remember in the 80s, 90s, IBM won uh, against um, uh, Kasparov, right? They use Deep Blue, which basically tried to do brute force. Well, you could do some brute force with chess, with AlphaGo you cannot. And uh, there's a beautiful movie on Netflix uh, about AlphaGo that uh, shows how this machine beat the best in the world, which is uh, Lisi Doll. Now what happens is that machine did not know how to play Go, so they trained it on different games. Um, and then, after they played against Lisi Doll, they trained a new machine that played only against itself. This is the, the green line is the level of the machine that won against Lisi Doll. And they passed it, like after three days of training against itself, not knowing any other game from history, it became the best in the world. They actually unleashed that agent on the forums in, uh, in, in Go and 
it won so many things that the community started looking at it a bit weird. Who's that player that wins everybody and they promise not to do it again? But basically, this is all AI. This is all deep neural networks, right? By DeepMind. We also did it. They also did it on different games. This is Dota 2. And this is a very complex game where you're playing five against five. Uh, and they managed to beat the best in the world with that game. Basically, if you take Go that has in, insane amounts of possibilities and you take games like that, uh, and it only took them around from March 1st to August 11th to beat the best team in the world, right? Uh, which is crazy. There's no game that a machine cannot play better than a human being. And again, the only input to that machine is the pixels, right? Nothing else. They do not know anything about the rules of the game. Um, so we also had uh, progress with other things. Like Google did the translation. You know that uh, translation is pretty big. They moved, uh, I think, a year or two ago to, to AI-only uh, translation. But what was interesting about this concept was they had two kinds of translation, from English to Korean and from English to Japanese. And what they noticed is that the model can, inf can do Korean to Japanese on its own which is insane because they didn't have that, uh, it was a, side, a nice side effect. Uh, we also know how to colorize images, right? Uh, and just think, how, how do you train a machine like that? It's very easy. You take a lot of images with, uh, that are colored and you take out all the colors. It's very easy. You just average the RGB and you get a, a gray uh, scale. Uh, and then you feed it and the error is the delta between what you got from the uh, uh, network and what you have, right? The machine can spit not just results of confidence, it can also spit out pixels, right? Um, we can do uh, uh, rebranding of things, right? Uh, it's called cycle gun. It's very easy also. We can turn winter to summer. We can uh, change even styles of uh, images to different things. Uh, we can do everything to everything, which is quite interesting. Uh, another interesting uh, project was, is, is a website that is called This Person Does Not Exist. This person does not exist, right? It generates completely believable uh, images. You couldn't tell that it's not, uh, uh, it's not true, right? Uh, this is the hardest for me. I have four kids. This is unbelievable. This kid, this baby does not exist. Uh, we can also do uh, night translation, and this is from around here, they tell me. Uh, just think about, we need more data, and this is another way of, to generate more data. Um, we can do, this is, by the way, we have no idea how to do those uh, filters in code. We must have uh, AI machines to do that for us. Uh, this is another interesting uh, concept. This is from Orcam. This is uh, uh, for visually impaired people. This is something that uh, sits on your glasses and reads, tells you what it is. And the challenge is to do that without a server. This is all running on that small device, uh, which is very interesting. Cost around $3,000, right? We can also describe things. We can see a pictures and tell you what we see inside, which is amazing, right? We can also generate images from text, right? Uh, which is... Right? Those images, again, does not exist in reality. It's generated by the text. We can also change poses. This is from uh, two years ago, three years ago, which is uh, interesting, right? Uh, and we also know how to generate. I won't do the demo because we don't have time, but uh, this is a, a, a study from Google that showed that if you have 24 hours of somebody's audio, we can generate that person saying anything that we want in any style. And three years ago, we needed 24 hours of audio. Now there's a startup that needs around two minutes. You go to Lyrebird, it can generate anything with your own voice. You record it in the browser, which is crazy. So we can generate anybody saying anything, right? And so if we can do that and we can generate also video, this happens. Right? This is insane, right? And we have this. 
This is by an Israeli company called Kani AI. It's really hard to believe with the guy, but... Uh, <laughs> but this is amazing. This is um, almost completely believable. And I can promise you that in the next 12 months, it will be so good, you will not be able to distinguish um, uh, what's right, what's real, and what's not. Right? Because this is the real poses. This is not generated. This is not artificially generated. This is just repurposing some of their own footage, um, which is crazy. Uh, and by the way, deep fakes are gaining a lot of noise right now. So guess what? Apple in iOS 13 embedded deep fakes your deep fakes inside. In iOS 13, there's going to be a new feature on FaceTime that will make sure that you always look on the camera, although you don't. So this guy is actually, his eyes are following the straw up and down. But iOS, with a deep fake and AI model, makes sure that he appears as looking at the camera all the time. This is a deep fake built in into iOS. This is not, uh, right? This is crazy, right? This is crazy. Um, so, but not everything is great, right? It's not perfect, it's, it's not there yet, not everything is there yet. This one is a Nest doorbell that was used to automatically lock um, uh, doors, and sometimes it did not work. And in that case, it, it got somebody uh, that shouldn't be there in, in the house. Uh, and there's also this, right? Somebody created a trap for autonomous cars because the car knows how to follow the rules. If they see a dotted line, they can pass it. See a, a full line, it stopped. It doesn't know how to do it. It's a real test that somebody did in 2017, right? They're as good as the data that they have, right? And building those machines is very, very hard because data scientists and engineers need to do so many steps in doing it. They need to collect data and they need to f uh, label the data and they need to do feature engineering and they need to train the machine and they need to deploy and they need to monitor and they need to do all sorts of things. And, and what we do at Missing Link is basically automate uh, all of that with, with our platform. I won't get into it, but this is what we exist. We want to bring best practices from software development into the AI era and make it super, super fast so data scientists can, can focus on data science and not doing things like DevOps or spinning machines and things like that. Now, it's obviously that this is the end of code, right? If we said that software is eating the world until now, AI is eating software. It's not about writing codes and algorithms anymore. It's just about being able to get your hands on data. And data is the most important thing. This is going to change everything for everyone. If you're thinking you can avoid it, anything in everything in your home is going to, even the keyboard on your iPhone is using AI to predict what would be the next letter that you're going to punch and actually makes the sensitive area for that letter bigger. So even if you have a typo, it won't be a typo. Right? It's all around us and it's going to be seamless. If, I, if there's one thing that I want you to take from it is that the data is the most important part. If you're an organization and you're not investing something around 15% of your budget, 15, 1, 5 percent of your budget to deal with data, to collect data, to tag data, you're doing something wrong. Right? If you want to be an AI first company like Facebook, like Google, like Amazon, you need to start to deal with your data. Your data, the data is your future to success, is their future success, period. You will not be able to compete with a, another company that does the exactly same thing as you, as you do using AI, right? If you're going to stay behind, you're going to lose. That's it. Thank you very much. Come see us at the booth. I'll be available outside. <laughs>